welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, EMRS to go. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections have been muted at this time. You are, however, welcome to submit written questions at any time during today's presentation. Just go to the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. Should you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I would also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Brian Archer. Dr. Archer received a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from Kansas State University in 1997 and received a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Kansas State in 1999. He has worked for USDA Animal Health, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, Veterinary Services since 1997. Brian worked as a field veterinary medical officer in South Dakota, a supervisory veterinary medical officer in Topeka, Kansas, and transitioned back to the field as a field veterinary medical officer in Kansas located in McPherson. Nationally, Dr. Archer has been extensively involved in a number of animal disease emergencies, including serving as a member of one of the USDA's five national incident management teams. Currently, Dr. Archer is an EMRS staff specialist with USDA APHIS VS National Preparedness and Incident Coordination. And with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Dr. Archer. Thank you, Liz. Well, good morning, everybody. And first and foremost, thank you very much for attending today's presentation. Um, I'm going to go over, obviously, EMRS to go. I'm going to, first of all, start off with some generalized information about the offline application that we have. And then I'm going to demonstrate how you can use EMRS to go to enter information for a routine FAD investigation, as well as show you how you can use the application um, for routine tasks such as EIA lab inspections, garbage feeding inspections, ADT inspections, that type of thing. Um, I think you'll find it very informative, very easy to use this app. Um, and with that, we'll jump right in. So with the next slide, our offline application is a, is a very powerful tool that we've developed. It's primarily for state and federal uh, animal health users, so FADDs, VMOs, and AHTs. Um, and they're going to use it to collect information pertaining to foreign animal disease investigations or incident-related field response, in addition to some routine activities, which we'll talk about as we get deeper into this. But basically, information is collected and entered directly into the DeGo app on a tablet, laptop, or PC. It's important to note that a Windows platform is required and Apple systems are currently not supported. It's also important, and I don't have listed on this slide, but your laptop, tablet, or PC must have encryption uh, software loaded up to it, such as BitLocker or McAfee. Information can be entered offline, as I've already mentioned, and then uploaded into EMRS when the user has internet access at a later time. One of the neat things about this app is that you enter the information directly in the field, and then once you upload it into the system, it automatically all goes in, and the system does a lot of uh, back-end workflows to create a bunch of different forms and records, and the bottom line is there's no duplicate data entry required, so you're not having to type up an email and send it to somebody else to enter the information in EMRS. You're not having to write it down on a piece of paper and then enter it in later when you get back to your office. When you do it um, in the app and upload it, boom, it all happens automatically for you. One thing to note, though, the mobile application that we're going to talk about today does require the user to have actual EMRS access. Um, the bottom line is, is you're pulling information down out of EMRS to populate your app, and then you're also sending information back up into the system, obviously. In order to be able to submit information into EMRS, you have to have the exact same access as though you pulled up EMRS Actual and are hand entering the information. So to get access to EMRS, it requires three steps you have to complete what's called an APHIS Form 513. Um, that's a very, very short form to complete. It literally takes only a couple of minutes. You have to be EOS Level 2 credentialed, um, and your local ADIC office can help you out with that. And then you do have to complete the Information Security Awareness Training. Federal users complete that training via AgLearn. State users complete it via an online documentation. Once you have those three steps completed, you submit that APHIS Form 513 to an EMRS network associate, and they process it and request access to EMRS for you. 
Once that access request has been made, you generally have your access to the system granted to you within 24 hours. So it can all happen very, very quickly. Okay, so what forms do we currently have in the EMRS to go mobile application that you can use? We have what's called the initial contact report, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as simply the contact report. That report is used to capture information associated with a foreign animal disease investigation, and we'll also use it for backyard or door-to-door -door surveillance testing when we're on an incident. If samples are collected, what's really cool about this, this application and this ICR report is that with the information you enter into the ICR, the system will automatically generate a completed BS 10-4 form for you. Um, so that's really handy. If you have a, a Bluetooth printer or something like that in your GOV, you can literally print a completed 10-4 right there in your truck. One of the other neat features are if we have, for example, um, an incident ongoing and we have an office chief sitting in the office somewhere and they, they are assigning exams to people, um, the assigned individual, when they print their to-go application, if an exam was assigned to them, that exam assignment will automatically show up in their briefcase in the app, which I'll show you here in a few minutes. You do not have to have somebody manually, I'm sorry, assigning those exams in the system directly to you, though. You can also manually create an ICR directly from the briefcase. And then once uploaded in the MRS, that's where the background magic happens. That information you enter into that contract report will automatically be converted to a premises, an animal business, investigation, completed exams, submitted lab submission with all its specimens, in addition to a quarantine status if one was issued, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with no further action or data entry required by anybody else. As already mentioned, one of the other forms we have currently in the to-go app are the tasks. Um, we can use TAF for a couple of different things. One, for routine use, which I'll demonstrate today, for something like an EIA lab inspection, ADP inspections, et cetera. But we also use TAF on incident. And for those of you that were recently deployed to California for the BMD incident, you'll know that we use those TAF to track fallow checks, file security audits, and the like. One little difference between the TAF and the contact reports is that while you can manually create a contact report directly within the application, a task has to be created in EMRS first and assigned to an individual. And I'll show you that as we go through this uh, a little bit later today as well. The third form we currently have in the to-go mobile application of the case manager 214. I'm not going to demonstrate that today, but know it's there. And if you want training on it, you can reach out to one of our EMRS network associates. But if you find yourself being a case manager on an incident due to some positive premises and you're working with a particular producer, to get that prim uh, back to business. Um, know that we do have the case manager 214 ability to track those directly in this to-go mobile application. As we move forward, we will be adding other forms such as epidemiology reports, um, VS-123s, et cetera, as future enhancements come online, those will automatically be downloaded to your to-go mobile application. We also are looking at adding a mapping system to it, which is going to be very, very cool. So let's say, for example, you have a tablet, um, that you be able to, you're able to access the internet directly from your tablet, or if you want to pull out your phone and use your phone as a hotspot, and you're in an urban setting like you were in Southern California, you'll be able to open up this app and pull up the map and be able to see exactly what street you're standing on and what houses have already been visited versus those that have not. Um, so that'll be a very handy tool once we get it released. The application also has the ability to attach additional files, such as PDF files, Word, JPEG, um, movies, whatever it may be, Excel spreadsheets, to any of these records that you see here. Um, so that can be very handy as well. Here's a quick little process flow diagram to show you how it works. It's starting up here in the upper left. Basically, an assignment can be made in EMRS Actual to a field DMO or HT in either an exam or a task, okay? When you get to within two, 10 days of the due date that was put in for that exam or task, when that field personnel opens it to go app and syncs it, they'll receive that assignment in their briefcase in the to go app, which I'll talk about and show you again here in a few minutes. Alternatively, you can, this step does not have to happen. The field DMO or field personnel can manually create an ICR or a 214 using the plus button directly in the app. Once they do that, they then can move on to the next step, and the next step does not require an internet connection. They go out in the field, they complete their assignment, they enter the information in to go, and now they're ready to upload it back into the system. So 
So once they're ready to upload, they'll obtain an internet connection. They can obtain that internet connection by returning to their ODS. They can pull out their phone, like I said before, and use it as a hotspot. You can stop by a, a coffee shop or whatever that has free Wi-Fi. Bottom line is you just connect back to the internet. And then you're going to send that information back up into the system. And as soon as you do that, the IMT or the area office or the state animal health official immediately has access to those uploading reports for review and follow-up or action as required directly in PMRS. So what's this to-go mobile application look like? Well, basically, FADDs and others requiring access will be provided with download instructions. And once you download it, this icon that you see here on the screen is going to appear on your desktop, okay? You open the app and just simply double-click on that icon. When you double-click on that icon, what's, going to, what's called the briefcase will open up with the to-go application. And initially, the first time you do this, this will be blank. There won't be anything in the briefcase. It'll be just a white screen, okay? But the screenshot I've got here shows you a couple of different forms that we'll talk about today. But I want you to notice a couple of different things about this screen. Number one, across the top of the screenshot here, it's, it's hard to see because it's in light gray, but it says it's targeting training. The app can be pointed to EMR's training site or the live production site. So if you want to practice with it, we can show you how to change the target environment from production to training. You can practice all you like. <laughs> and then you can switch it back to production when you're ready to enter in live or real data up in the EMRS itself. There's a menu button, which you'll learn about here in just a few seconds. There's a drop down, so you can sort by different forms. And then there's the plus button in the bottom right hand corner. And that's it. The app is very, very easy to drive and easy to navigate. You'll also notice that with the three types of forms I'm showing on the screen, we have a task due on 615.20 at Equine Vet Services. This is for an EIA lab inspection. If I wanted to complete this task or edit this task, I would click the edit button and it would open up that specific task. Directly below the task, you can see an example for a 214 daily log. And directly beneath that, you can see a contact report <coughs> for an HBAI event at a certain, certain tendency. The first time you download the application to your desktop, you must also download information or sync your app with EMRS. What you're basically doing is you're populating a lot of drop downs and lookups within the application. Um, what we've done is we've made it very, very quickly and easy and streamlined for you to perform the data entry requirements by using all these drop downs. So you basically just click and select different options, and you'll get to see that here in a second. But you have to perform that sync first. So when you download the app, you want to go ahead and perform a sync right away while you're still connected to the Internet. To perform a sync, you simply click, the, click on the menu button in the upper left-hand corner. A window will pop out. You'll see the option to return to the briefcase, send, receive, map, which you currently do not have. When I took this screenshot, I took it from our, our test environment we're working on when we're developing that map, but you'll see it eventually, and then settings. To receive information to populate your, your to-go application with the lookup information, you simply click on the Receive tab. When you do that, you'll get this screen here. And you can select to either do new and updated records or a full synchronization. Obviously, the first time you do it, it'll be a full synchronization. And then once you select that radio button option, you'll select the C number two in the bottom right-hand corner, which is the download button. Once you've downloaded and synced, you'll want to do a new and updated records only a few times a month, every time you open the app or every, every couple of weeks. And when you do a new and updated records only, that only takes all, generally is less than a minute. A full sync can take a couple minutes. Anyway, so you'll select for full synchronization the first time, then select the download button. When you do that, you'll be then prompted to enter in your eAuth credentials. Remember, you are accessing EMRS. Therefore, you have to have permission to enter information into EMRS. So it's going to require your e-authentication credentials here. Simply click Login Link Pass if you're a federal user and enter your PIV card information. Your state user, put in your user ID and password and select Login. As soon as you do that, the app will tell you that records are about to be downloaded, which is exactly what you want. So you'll select OK. Once you select OK, you'll see all these green check marks start to show up and all the different entities that are going to receive information from EMRS. And again, if you're doing a full synchronization, this can take a couple minutes. 
If you're doing new and updated records only and you sync fairly often, it will go very, very quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. Once this little box pops up, it tells you reference data download is complete. You simply click, click on OK, select your menu button up here where you see number two, and then return to the briefcase by selecting number three. Once you do that, you'll be taken back to your briefcase. If somebody has already assigned exams or tasks to you in EMRS Actual, those exams or tasks will then show up in your briefcase. If nobody assigned anything to you, then this will show up as blank. Or alternatively, one other thing I need to mention is the only time implement, uh, I'm sorry, assigned exams and tasks will show up in your briefcase is if you're within 10 days of that due date. Okay, that's when they'll show up. Alternatively, if you need to enter information manually for an FAB investigation or a 214 daily log, you can always click this plus button down here in the bottom right hand corner. When you do that, a window pops open, giving you the option to select contact report or a daily log. Okay? So what I want to do now is I want to demonstrate this to you to show you how quick and easy it is. Okay. So I'm going to quickly share my monitor. And you should now be looking at my monitor. Somebody holler if, you're, if you don't see it. So you can see over here I've got the EMRS to go mobile application um, icon. Once it's downloaded to your laptop, tablet, or PC, you simply double click on the icon. And when you do that, your um, to go app will open your briefcase as you see here. And initially you can see that my briefcase is empty. So the first time you download, you want to come up here to the menu button, select the menu button. Select Receive, and then do a full synchronization. Once you select full synchronization, you'll just select the download button. And in the interest of time, I'm obviously not going to do that now. After you've done a sync, um, you can go back to your briefcase by selecting the menu button and return to your briefcase. And now your application is ready to be taken offline, go into the field, and enter information in for a routine FAD investigation or back drug surveillance which is what I'll go ahead and demonstrate now. So I'm going to demonstrate the manual creation of a contact report. So to do that, you simply click the plus button in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. The window pops open. Here's my two options. And as I mentioned, as we go forward, you'll eventually see additional forms fill in here that you can use, such as FEA reports, et cetera. But for right now, I'm going to do a contact report. The contact report field opens. You'll notice that a lot of these fields are in red. Red means it's a required field for entry. You'll also notice that when you click on one of these, so the first one is incident, which is a required field, and I've got FAD here. And if I select it by clicking on it, I can see all the incidents that we have in EMRS. And this happens to be the training incident, of course, of EMRS. These lookups that we're looking at now, this is what the sink was populating. I'm going to go ahead and select FAD for a routine FAD investigation. What's my investigation reason? Is it a complaint, a surveillance, or trace? I'm going to say this is a complaint. What's my investigation type? Again, we have a bunch of different types listed here. But don't forget, you can look over to the right, and you have a scroll bar to scroll through additional options. Okay, and I'm going to select vesicular with popular erosion. What's my FAD classification? Undetermined, high, intermediate, or low suspicion, I'll say undetermined. And then what's my FAD referral control number? So I'm just going to go ahead and enter in a fake number here using the standardized format for my control number. What's my exam reason for FAD? Is this a follow-up or a SIP call? Well, obviously, first time you go out on these, are usually a SIP call. And what's my investigation source? When I click on this option, am I, is a diagnostic lab reporting this event? Is it somebody else, a practitioner, a producer? I'll go ahead and select the producer. What state am I working in? It defaults to the last state you are working in, so it shows Kansas right now. So you can select other states if you happen to be deployed somewhere else. And then based on what state you select, when you select, click on the investigator line, you'll only get investigators that are in that state. I'm going to go ahead and use myself as the investigator. What date was this visit made? That's obviously a required field. If you look over to the right, you see that there's a little calendar icon. When you click on the calendar icon, the calendar pops up, and you can select the day. What type of visit? Is this an initial first, second, or third revisit? I'll say this is an initial visit. And then was a quarantine applied? You do not have to enter in a quarantine date and a quarantine number. 
But if you did put in a if you did issue a quarantine, again, you can put in the date, <coughs> and you can put in a quarantine number. Then you can put any overall comments down here, such as initial history that was uh, reported, or whatever you want to put down in this line. Um, keep one thing to keep in mind, though: anytime you have the option to enter in text in any of these fields, you want to be succinct and limit it to about 150 characters or less. Once you have this first page completed, simply click the arrow button over here in the lower right-hand corner to go to the next page. This is where you'll put in the PREM information. If you know a PREM ID, you can enter it. If you do know a PREM ID and you enter it and you click outside this line, all this stuff will auto-populate for you. If you don't know a PREM ID, that's fine. You can simply skip it. And go ahead and enter in. Oops, excuse me. The premises name. You can type in a brief description of that PREM if you like, but it's not required. Then you can enter in the PREM type. And you'll notice again that we have all these PREM types already in the system for you to select from. I'm going to select Farm Ranch. Now you're going to enter in your physical address. The state, I'm sorry, the city and the state, and you'll get there. Okay? One thing about the physical address of the PREM, um, try to always use a 911 address if you have one for the animal location. If we're talking about barns, chicken houses, dairies, feedlots, that type of thing. If you're doing an FAD investigation for a cow-calf operation, the cattle are out on pasture or whatever, then obviously you'll use the ranch headquarters as the physical address here, even if those animals are located a few you know, miles away or whatever it may be out in the pasture. Get down to the prim latitude and longitude. Always get in the habit of entering in your latitude and longitude information in decimal degree format. If you happen to have a tablet that has uh, a GPS feature in it, you can use the GPS button here to automatically grab those coordinates. Most of us will not have that, so you'll want to use an app off of your phone or whatever to grab your coordinates, um, and then you can just type them in. And then you can also enter in PREM driving directions if you'd like to with the premises. Again, multiple lines are allowed, but you need to be limited to about 150 characters or less. Once you have this page completed, click on the arrow. Are susceptible species for the incident selected found on this premises? Well, obviously, since this is an FAD investigation, this will be yes. If we're doing door-to-door -door surveillance um, on an incident, such as what we were recently doing in California, then the answer may be no to this address. But for here, we're going to say yes. Estimated total number of susceptible species on the PREM, and then in your number. What's your production type? And again, you have an option, drop-down options, I'm sorry, to select through. I'm going to go ahead and go with cow-calf. What's the primary species group? Select as appropriate. Remember, you can scroll. These are cattle. Are clinical signs present? Yes or no. Obviously, for a reported FAD investigation, they probably are. So I'm going to select yes. What's my most prevalent clinical sign? Um, we'll say that for this one, um, the initial call reported in was blisters or vesicles. Estimated date of onset, again, you have a calendar option over here on the right, or you can manually type in the date if you want, but we'll say that they, you know, since they started over the weekend. And then you can put in some further explanation of clinical signs if you want. Type in whatever you want for a further explanation of clinical signs. Okay, now we're getting to our premises contact. Who is the person on the prem that you're working with? First name, last name, and you can put in their phone number. It's not required, but you can also put in an email address. Go to the next page. Now we're going to put in our morbidity mortality census, and a lot of people forget to do this step, and it's, it's vitally important, so I'm going to encourage you to do it. In future releases of the app, we're probably going to make this a required step. But you notice we have morbidity mortality census, and we jump right into primary differentials. What people miss is this little add button over here to the right. When you click on the add button, a box pops up to allow you to add feces. We'll say that there's cattle, obviously. We'll say we had two that were sick zero that are dead, 
leaving us 33 that are unaffected. Let's say they also had some horses on this premises or some hogs or sheep or whatever. You can continue to click the Add button and add additional lines. For our primary differential, we've got a huge list of diseases in here for you to select from. If you start typing on your keyboard, you'll jump right down to that area. So I typed in FOOC and I jumped right down to foot and mouth disease so I can select it. What's my primary confidence? We'll say that it's unlikely. But we've also had a lot of testicular stomatitis in Kansas this year, and I think the testicular stomatitis may be possible. Okay? So you can select a couple of different differentials and then go to the next page. <coughs> this page is where you'll, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, had a little simple. This page is where you will enter in your samples for the samples you've collected. Pretty, pretty intuitive. You just click the Add Sample button, and a record will open. So your subject type are these individually identified animals, animals without ID, so individual animals without ID, identifiable animal groups, maybe there's a hogs with slap tattoos or whatever, or these groups of animals such as chickens in a poultry house or turkeys in a poultry house. We'll say that I'm sampling an individually identified cow. So I'm going to put in her ear tag. And then the primary identifier type is just an official ear tag, name, tattoo, brand, RFID, farm tag, whatever. Obviously, that's an official ear tag. Best for one identifier, I'll put in a barcode, and then I can select my specimen type. We'll say that this is serum. But today, I took another sample, and this was an oral swab. So I'm going to take my specimen two type. Scroll down until I find oral swab, but you notice there's a lot of different sample types we have available. And I could then identify, put in a third and a fourth if I'd like to. With those specimen types, in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and skip those for now. Come down to my species. You'll note that since I selected cattle previously as my primary species on the prim, that pops up directly to the front. If I'd also sampled sheep or goats or whatever, I could also find them down here. But obviously, this sample, this animal, this is for cattle. We'll say it's an Angus. I'm going to type A and G U S and jump right down to it, or I can scroll down. She's a female. In the age field, I can put in a number, and in the qualifier, I can say days, weeks, months, or years. I do not have to have a number in the age field, however. I can just select adult, not indicated, or enter a date over here for date of birth. I'm going to go ahead and just select adult. What's my current subject condition? Well, this animal happens to be clinical. And then you can type in a brief description if you like. I'll say that I found a, one centimeter, a two centimeter by one centimeter erosion on the dorsal surface of the tongue. Again, you can type a subject description here. It would probably be succinct, less than 150 characters or less. How many animals? We're in this group that she came out of. Let's say that she is with that group of 35, and I only sampled her. She's the only one sampled in this specimen collection record. What do I think the clinical onset was for her? Again, you pick the date you deem appropriate, and then you can enter in up to three clinical signs for this animal. So again, we can say that I looked in her mouth and I found some erosions. So I'll select erosions. If I had additional clinical signs, which is febrile, off asymptomatic, off feed, whatever it may be, I can select it up to two additional clinical signs. I simply then hit the Save button, and now I've got my first sample entered. Now, admittedly, entering that information in on sample information for an animal or group of animals, that first one takes you just a few minutes to do. There's a lot of information to enter and capture. But once you've got the first one in, the next ones go very, very quickly. And the reason they do is because I've got this little ellipses icon up here. I can click on it, and now I can use this copy button. And if I select this copy button, it's going to copy everything we just saw that we entered for this animal, except for her ID and the specimen number. And I can go in and just enter in the ID and specimen numbers for the next set of animals, for the next animal. So if I took the same type of sample, I can quickly enter in a bunch of results. If, I'm sorry, a bunch of specimens if I'd like to. If I made a mistake in this record and need to go back in and edit it, I just simply click the edit button and it'll open it back up. In the interest of time, though, I'm just going to move on. So I'm going to hit the arrow button. And now we get to the lab submission. So what lab is this going to? When I select it, 
Note that the labs are identified by their state that they're located in first. So these were going to New York and Plum. So I'm going to scroll on down to New York. And I'm going to select Fatal Oil at Point New York. Submission date, we'll say we submitted them today. Lab submission reason, got all our reasons in here. This is going to be for an FAD or an EDI. And then what's the submitter name? If the submitter happens to be the same as the investigator, you can simply click the Copy Investigator button and these will auto-populate for you. If the submitter is different, then obviously you can manually enter them in. Put in your tracking number, put in your shipping method, you see the options here. And then what priority? One, two, three, or A. We'll say this is priority three. Two of your differentials that I've already entered automatically carry over. If you have a third, you have the option to add a third differential if you would like. Your preservation, select is appropriate. Most of the time we're going to be using chemical ice packs, of course. And then you can also enter any submission comments if you'd like to for the ad. Hit the arrow button and now you're at the very last page. These are all the pages that I filled out with our information. If I've missed any required information, instead of seeing a green check mark, I would see a red exclamation point on any one of these pages. EMRS to go will not allow you to upload the contact report and back into EMRS unless all these check marks are green. So there's a little safety check for you. In addition to that, you have this line here where you can add some additional comments. Now you'll note that when I put in that previous history before, that already got carried over for me, but I can also add additional data if I'd like, such as, you know, provided the um, producer the file security information, contacted via phone to discuss the priority. You know, whatever you want to put here, you can. But again, you're limited, so you need to be kind of suspicious. After you've done that, you hit the Save button. You're taken back to your briefcase, and now your contact report is ready for the next step, okay? I hope you saw that you can do this very, very quickly and very efficiently with all those drop-downs. I mean, it goes, it goes quite fast, but you capture a lot of very important information um, pretty quickly, okay? So with that being said, I'm going to go back to a PowerPoint presentation. I'll take you to the next page here. So you should be all you should all be back to the PowerPoint now. Somebody holler at me if you're not. So basically we just created that contact report using the manual option hitting the plus button. And now I'm going to show you the forms and the attachments button that you saw there with that contact report. When you click on the Forms tab, a window will pop open allowing you to create either a VS-104 specimen submission form or an avian influenza specimen submission form. Now, one thing to note, that avian influenza specimen submission form we have in there to show you the capabilities. So if, for example, at some point the non-labs decide to go universal with us on, on a form in, a, in an incident that's kind of regionalized or widespread, then we have the ability to create other forms directly in the system. Um, but for the most part, we're only going to be using this VS10-4 for the majority of the time. So you click on the Forms button, the window pops open, and when you select the VS10-4 form, this page will open in your to-go app. Note all the fields that are in orange, okay? All the fields that show up in orange that are highlighted orange here on this record will automatically completed for you based on the information you entered in that contact report. So the producer name's in there, your name's in there, the number of animals from your census are in there, the reason for the submission, the barcode, the animal ID, the whole nine yards. The only information you have to manually enter is what's highlighted in yellow. So you'll enter in your mailing address, the county, who authorized you to submit these samples to Plum, and then down at the bottom, a brief clinical history. Once you have entered that brief little information, you click on the export PDF button up there in the top left to turn this form into a PDF document. When you click that export PDF button, a window will pop open asking you to name the document and asking you where you want to save it on your laptop or tablet, okay? So you'll name it using the standardized naming convention of the referral number, business name, the form name, which is the VS-104, and then the date. And you'll just save it. Once you save it, 
the PDF will open for you and look just like the pen for you used to looking at. So now if you happen to have a printer in your truck, a Bluetooth printer, a battery-operated printer, um, which I know several states now do have, you can print this specimen submission form right there in your vehicle, find it, drop, put it in the box, and drop it off with FedEx on your way home. Now we're going to talk about that other button you can see, which is the attachments button. When you click that attachments button, a window will open up, as you see here. And one thing to note is that the PIN4 you just created, as long as you did it first, you did the forms button first, that PIN4 will automatically attach in here. Um, so that way when you upload it to EMRS, a copy of your PIN4 automatically goes into EMRS as well. You don't have to do anything else. But if you want to add additional attachments, such as pictures or Excel spreadsheets that have an inventory or or whatever it may be, to add additional attachments, simply click the plus button. When you click that plus button, the window will open up. You navigate on your laptop to wherever you have the picture you want to attach. Simply attach it. And then it goes up. It's very simple. Now, you've got the form completed, the contact report completed. You've created your 10 4. You've got your attachments added. The only thing left to do is to send this report back up in the MRS. So now is when you have to grab internet connection again. All the steps prior to this, you could have done offline, okay? So you pull out your phone, use it as a hotspot, hook up to your elaborate laptop or tablet, whatever it may be. Once you're connected, you select the menu button. And then after you select the menu button, you're gonna select the send button. When you select send, you get to the screen, it'll show you all of the documents you currently have in your briefcase that are eligible to go to the MRS. You make sure that they are checkmarked, they've shown, and then you select the little paper airplane icon in the bottom right-hand corner. When you do that, once again, you're going to be pinged to enter in your e-authentication credentials because, once again, you're now entering information into EMRS Actual, so you have to have permission to be able to do that. Enter in your credentials, and then it literally only takes a couple seconds. Um, once your credentials are entered, you'll see a little arrow starts spinning right here by your report, and in a few seconds it disappears and it's sent up to the MRS. And that's it. It's pretty quick and it's pretty easy to get that information into the system. And that's it for the contact report. What I want to spend a couple of minutes now doing is talking about the routine task and how you can also use the MRS to go for assigning, managing, and tracking these tasks that you might be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. The tasks, as I mentioned previously, have to be done um, they have to be created, I'm sorry, in EMRS Actual and assigned to somebody. And once you assign it to somebody, the system then, when they do a sync with their to-go app, it will automatically show up in their briefcase. So what I have that broken out here is an office activity and a field activity. So in the office, you can do this in your ODS at home or if somebody in the area office or state animal health officials office is assigning work to people out in the field, they open up EMRS, they navigate to the appropriate animal business that they want the task done on, they create the task and assign it to a resource. The resource is field personnel. Then they also attach the inspection form that they want that person to use to that task. And then that's it. The field then will go out and they'll sync their to-go. And when they sync their to-go, that task will automatically show up in the briefcase and that inspection form will be attached to that task. They open up that inspection form, they complete it, they save it to their hard drive, attach it back to that task, and then sync it back into the system or send it back into the system. That's pretty, that's pretty much it. It's pretty simple, but I'll demonstrate that here right now. Okay, so what I want to do again is I'm going to share my screen. Okay, you should back, be looking at my desktop once again. What I'm going to do this time is I'm going to open up EMRS Training, which is where I'm located now. And I've navigated to an animal business, okay? So I've got Heartland Equine Services here, which is just a, a fictitious equine clinic here in the state of Kansas. And let's say that this, this premises is an EIA-approved lab, okay? And so we want to go first take a look at the other inspections that have been done on this prem. I can use the toolbar at the top. When I click on this little down arrow next to Heartland Equine Services, I see all the information I can look at that's been done on this prem, but I want to look at the task. You can see that there have been three inspections performed already on this premises, okay? With this task here, there's an initial EIA inspection that's performed. 
back on, in September of 2017. Then in September of 2018, there was an EIA lab inspection done. That was an annual lab inspection. And another one was done in 2019, okay? And I can open up any one of these tasks and view the work that was done if I'd like to. But what I need to do now is I need to schedule one for 2020. So how do I create that task? Well, it's pretty simple. I come back to the main page by clicking on Heartland Equine Services. I'm back to the main page for the animal business. I just simply click on the Business Follow-Ups button, which allows me to add information to this business. Options pop up for me to add different things to this animal business, and I want to add an inspection task that's not investigation related. I select the radio button and click Next. It says, okay, well, what kind of task am I adding? Am I adding an ADT inspection, blood and tissue collection inspection, EIA lab, EU export, garbage feeders, whatever it may be? Obviously, this one's going to be an EIA lab inspection. So I select that, hit next. And now I have a couple of options for my task reason. Is it an annual EIA lab inspection or an initial? Well, obviously, this is an annual one. I can add a subcategory if I want to provide additional information about this task, but I don't need to. Then I can select the date that this inspection is due. And let's say you want this done by the 14th. Here's the resource that I'm assigning to do the work. Type in the name, hit the search button. And when you do that, you see my name popped up twice. I currently have another rotation in there for an incident in High Path AI 2017. Now remember, we are in training, so this is kind of junk data. But if you ever see this happen, you always want to select the routine resource not associated with an incident for routine work, and this is a routine EIA lab inspection. I'm not associated with an incident somewhere. So I'm going to select my routine resource. Then I can type in a description of the task that I want the field person to do. You can type in whatever you'd like here. You are not limited to 150 characters in this field. Once you've got this basic information entered, select Next. And just that quickly, you've created the task. So I'm going to select Next and finish this out. And just to show you, now when I click this drop down and I select Task, instead of seeing three, I'm going to see four. I've got the three previous tasks in here, and now I've got the fourth one. I want to go ahead and open up this task by clicking on the TK number to open the task up. And here you can see that it's regarding Heartland Equine Services is this task. It's an EIA lab inspection. An annual inspection is required. It's assigned to Brian Archer in the field. And this is the due date. Now, what's really cool about this is that this due date, what the EMRS is going to do is, let's say that this, I had created this task for a year out from now. The EMRS is going to automatically send me an email 30 days out from my due date, letting me know that I've got a task coming up due. The EMRS will automatically send the field individual that's assigned to do this work another reminder 10 days out from the due date. Then the system, if the task does not get completed, will automatically send out one more reminder one day after the due date. To let that field person know that they had a task to do. Okay, so that's a pretty neat feature. So one other thing I want to show you is that notice we have down here in the notes. I told you that we can also attach the inspection form we want this field investigator to use. To do that, we have this attach button here. So what we've done is we've taken all the forms that are required and we've put them directly in the system. So if I select this little ellipses icon, you see we have this option called Word Templates. When I click on Word Templates, we have a bunch of different forms in here. And again, this is training. If you go to production, you'll see additional forms and maybe the real forms, okay? So we've got an ADT inspection checklist here. We've got an approved livestock facility inspection checklist, EEM, EIA, garbage feeding, et cetera, et cetera. And I want this EIA lab inspection checklist. So I click on it. It takes just a second, and the form opens. And it popped onto a different monitor, so I'm going to bring it over here. But now you can see that the form is auto-filled out with a lot of information. It put in Heartland Equine Services. It put in the assigned investigator. It put in the date, et cetera, et cetera. The other neat thing about this is it's a fillable form. So you can click on the drop down and enter in your date, that type of thing. And the form also is fillable in that you can click your check boxes. But right now, this is just a blank form that I need, right? So I'm going to file. I'm going to save this form to my hard, to my desktop. Okay. 
and I'm going to save it with whatever name I want to give it directly to my desktop. And I'm going to save it with just the Heartland Equine EIA Lab Inspection blank as its name, because right now it hasn't been completed yet. Now that I've saved it to my hard drive with all the information completed out at EMRS, I can attach it right here. I'll choose my file. I'm going to navigate to my desktop to where I have it. And I'm going to attach it right there. Now, if I'm the person assigning these investigations, or I'm sorry, these inspection tasks or whatever, my job is done. All I've done is I've quickly created a task. I've used the word templates to grab the right form. I've pulled the form down and saved it, and then I've attached it. I'm done. Okay? Now, what's the field person do? Well, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to go back to, the, to my presentation here. So you should be looking at my presentation again. And now we've moved to the field aspect, okay? The field person, as I, as I already mentioned, is going to get an automatic email out of EMRS from there, 30 days out, and then again 10 days out, um, that due date from the task. When they get that 10-day notification, that's their cue to go in and perform a sync with their to-go. So they perform a sync. They open up their to-go and note that initially the briefcase will be empty. They'll do their sync with new and updated records only, and then boom, that task automatically shows up in their briefcase for them to do. Okay? So how do they get that, that inspection form that they need to complete? All they do is they select the attachments button, and when they select it, they will see that that inspection form is sitting right there in their to-go briefcase. To get it out of to-go and onto their laptop so they can complete it, they simply click on the little ellipses icon and then click on extract. One thing I want you to notice, though, is there's also a replace. We're going to use that here in just a minute after the form is completed. But to get it out of to-go, they'll extract it. When they do, They'll choose where to save it on their hard drive, and then the form will open up. All they have to do then is complete the form, fill it out completely, save it back to their hard drive, and when they save it back, they don't use the word blank at the end. Instead, they put the date that they completed the inspection. They save the document. So they've just filled out a Word document basically on their, on their laptop. Then they'll go back into Go, click on the Attachments button, click on the little ellipses, and click Replace. When they click Replace, this blank document will disappear, and the completed one will now show up um, attached into Go to this task. What's really cool about that is when this gets uploaded back in the MRS, the blank one will also disappear in the original task in the MRS that was used to create this task, and the, the completed one will fill up in its place. Now all the investigator needs to do, since they've done the attachments piece, is edit this task to complete it. And editing this task to complete it literally takes just a couple of seconds. So you select the edit button, the task opens, they use the calendar icon to put in the date that they started this task, as well as the date they finished it. They'll put the hour or time of day they started, as well as the hour and time of day they finished. And you can see here I'm there from 2 to 3 o'clock. The system automatically calculates the duration it took you to complete this task, so this will be one hour. You select your task outcome, satisfactory or unsatisfactory. The task status, whether it's completed, in progress, waiting on something else, et cetera. If it's completed, you enter 100% with the percent complete, and then you select the Save button. Literally, these are all drop-downs or calendar icons that you select, so it goes very, very quickly. Once you hit that Save icon, the task then takes you back to your briefcase and it shows you it's completed. So now all you need to do is upload it back into EMRS. And the way you do that, again, you've already seen, is select the menu button, select send, connect to the internet, and enter in your PIV credentials or your EOS credentials, and away you go. And that's it. So it's pretty quick and pretty easy. What's also really neat about that, what I don't want you to miss out on, is since that inspection form is, is attached right there, it's now also attached in EMRS. Um, once it gets loaded up. So you can navigate back to that task and open it up and see everything that was done, whoever's managing the work. So it's pretty, pretty handy. In addition, you can also look at the previous year's task, like I showed you before, the previous year's inspection. And for example, for EIA Lab, you can open up last year's inspection report and see the technicians that were working. 
Um, so that way when you go this year, you can ask, okay, are these same technicians still here or are they not? Have any change, turnover, that kind of thing. Okay, so those were the goals I had for today was to show you how to fill out a to-go report um, for a contact, a routine FAD investigation or initial contact report, as well as showing you how to be tasked in the system. For additional assistance or self-training or practice or drills, we have a lot of options for you. I've created several new training videos that will take you step-by-step -step through the process of creating a contact report for a routine FAD investigation. Okay, I've also created a training video that shows you how to utilize the task feature. It goes through a little bit more detail and just a little bit slower than I did today, and they're available for you to watch at your leisure. These training videos are on the FADI SharePoint site, um, but access is limited to that FADI SharePoint site. You have to have EOS level two. Um, if you don't have access to that site and need some instructions, just shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to walk you through that. Um, there's my email address listed on the screen. We also have several drills and data entry guides posted in the training entity directly in EMRS. If you want to find those drills or some of those SOPs on how to step-by-step -step walk through some of this stuff, just reach out to an EMRS network associate for details. So the EMRS network associates are located on the home page of the EMRS screen. So just log into EMRS and they're right there available for you. So with that being said, that's all I have for today. So are there any questions that I can answer for you? I do have a few questions, Brian. Um, the first one is, let me find it now because I've got all this stuff in the chat. NBSL is encouraging submitters to use electronic 10-4 submission via the portal. Is there any intention to get EMRS to upload information directly to the electronic 10-4 submission? Yeah, we're working on that with the labs now. Um, that's all in process. Um, we're also working with them to message results back out because right now you have to manually enter in results. Um, I can tell you, I don't know exactly where that process stands, but Dr. Bourgeois has been working with NBSL and also with the NOL coordinator um, for that type of very thing. But I, I can't tell you where that is right now as it stands. I apologize, but I can't tell you that's being worked on. Well, good. The next question is, have, have any scenarios been created where we can practice EMRS to go using the EMRS training site? If not, how could one best support an EMRS to go remote training drill? Uh, the answer to your question is yes. We've created a video at that Fat Air, Fat Eye SharePoint site um, that shows you how to change the target environment from production to training and then back again. So that'd be your first step because when you download to go application for the first time, it will be targeting production. Okay. So if you want to practice, you have to change that target environment. It's very very easy to do. I've I've got some. Um, uh, electronic just Word document I can send you that walks you through it, or if you want to watch the training video, you're welcome to do that. In addition, I just uploaded, oh, a couple weeks ago into the drills in EMRS training, um, a drill for you to manually go through and enter in your first FAD investigation-like event um, using the to-go app and pointing it towards training so you can see how that works. Um, so, yeah, we do have some drills set up and ready to go for you to use. Um, just contact your EMRS network associate or send me an email if you don't know where to find those, and we'll help you find them. But so before okay. you go practice, make sure you switch over to training. The next question is, can the lab slash MVSL see pictures? Yes. Um, the lab does have access. Certain people in the lab, of course, if they request access, they can be granted access to EMRS. And when you upload the pictures, when you upload your case history, when you upload anything, any attachments that you happen to go are immediately available in EMRS. And all the lab would need to do is log into EMRS and, and pull up those pictures. Um, we provide them with a little bit of training so they'd see where to find them, but it's pretty easy to do. So anything you upload, they have access to. Okay. This is a, kind of a couple of questions. Um, is there a way to create incident-specific forms in EMRS that can be used in EMRS to go? Yes, there are. So I showed you the EIA lab inspection form today. Um, basically, we can create those word templates for just about any form. In fact, there were several that we created for the California VND incident. 
So let's say, for example, that your state um, has a particular form that they use for some type of routine inspection, or if we get into another incident and, and they generate their own surveillance form or whatever it may be. Um, all you've got to do is send that to Cami Shelley or I. Uh, we can convert that into a Word document and then attach okay. it right in that Word templates button that you saw me use here during this demonstration. So yeah, basically just send it to me in a Word document form and I can convert it and add it. Okay, we have a lot of questions from one person that I'm going to actually, Brian, I'm going to actually send those to you in a Word document. Um, sure. Just because of time constraints. Um, the next question I have, though, is how do you enter results for the sample taken for a subject? Yeah, so we didn't discuss that today. Um, and, and when we get into an incident, um, a lot of results from the non-labs will be messaged in automatically. Um, so that way there's not any manual entry that has to occur. However, with FAD investigations right now, NBSL labs are messaging some diseases. They'll message AI, SECD, as well as a couple of vesicular diseases. But other than that, they're not messaging at this time, but that's, that's being worked on, and I think eventually we'll get there. So you do have to manually enter in those results at this time. Um, for information and instructions on how to do that, I'd recommend just reaching out to an EMRS network associate. They'll be happy to give you with some of our um, standard operating guides and procedures, data entry guides and show you how to do it. It's, it's, it's pretty easy, but I'll also admit that entering test results is, is kind of not fun and a little bit time consuming, which is why we're moving towards the messaging where they just automatically get put into the system. Okay. Um, let's see. How frequently should someone think the EMRS to go to EMRS 2 using receive after initial installation? installation? Is there a time frame for publishing the map component in ERMS to go? Okay, so the first question is how often should you think? You know, routinely you don't do FAD investigations. They're not something we're doing every day. So if you use the app today and then, you know, you don't do another FAD investigation for a couple months, two, three months, it'd probably be a good idea just to do another full think. However, if you get into a situation where on an incident and you're getting into the app every day, okay, I'd recommend a sync maybe once or twice a week, and then you can just do the new and updated records only, which goes very, very, very quickly. So that question is really dependent on how often you're getting into the system and how often you're using it and how often information is being added into EMRS. So let's say, for example, that we get a, a, a brand new incident today called curly pigtail disease here in Kansas or whatever. I'm just obviously making that up. And you get sent out to do an incident to do a work on it, and you you open up to go and you hit your incident button and drop down and you don't see curly pigtail disease listed there. Well, what's that tell you? That tells you that you need to perform a sync to, to um, populate your app with the most current data. So then when you perform the sync and then you click on incident, you'll see that new incident show up. So the answer to your question is dependent on how often um, you're using your app as well as how often things are changing in the state you're working in. So if they're changing frequently, you'll want to sync more frequently. Um, if you haven't that performance sync in a long time, you'll want to do a full sync each time you use it. Um, the second question about the map and how quickly is that going to come, um, I can tell you that in development we're already working on it, um, and it's, it's looking pretty good. It's kind of a pretty neat feature. Um, as far as when we're going to be able to release it, I don't know where we are on the schedule working with IT for our next update with to go. Um, but one of the things that's going to come out with that update, I believe, is going to be the map package or the map function, as well as the ability to do E and D and C and D work um, using the app. So if, if the ops chief assigns the E and D to somebody um, as a team lead in the MRS, that E and D record would then populate in that individual's application when they perform the suit. So I think those are the things that are coming next. Um, as far as the timeline, I can't give you that. Right now, we're working on moving EMRS Actual to the newest version, which is version 9, so that's our main priority. But I don't think the goal will be too long after that. The next question is, how are states using EMRS to go for VSV investigations? Yeah, so some states are using it extensively and other states are not, which is, which is fine. 
I can tell you that, for example, here in the state of Kansas, we've had a lot of VSB investigations um, this year, and they were using the MRS to go um, very, very well. Dr. Cody Garten um, is a federal VMO here that was kind of helping and coordinating that, and then the state was entering in all the investigation using to go themselves, and Cody was then acting as the DRO once those came in to keep track of them and, and call those horses positive suspects, whatever they may be. Um, so yeah, they did. They used they used to go for VSB investigations and all they did and use it to manage and it worked very, very well. In addition to that, um, Cody was able to map everything very, very quickly and very, very easily because they did an excellent job of, of grabbing their coordinates and entering that into go as they went. So uh, it was a very powerful tool here in the state of Kansas. If you have questions about how they used it, I'd recommend reaching out to Dr. Garten um, specifically and visiting with him and I'm sure he could give you some some of the names of the state folks that were using it, if you'd like to talk to them too, assuming they're available and they're willing to visit, of course. Okay, so I'm gonna come up with the last two questions only because of the time frame. Um, are there reports available to summarize results for a particular incident? Uh, yes, yeah, we do that all the time. We pull off our after action reports, of course, when the incident is over, but during an incident, we're daily pulling our sit reps, and all that information is coming directly out of EMRS. Okay. Um, we do have a question about getting a copy of this PowerPoint. Um, if it's okay with you, Brian, I can also provide them a PDF file um, to all uh, everybody that's signed on. It's up to yep, you. Yep, that's perfectly fine, yep. And then the last question is, can you give some directions about how to find the instructions in FATI? Yeah, so when you go to the FATI site, um, you'll click on, on the, it's on the left-hand side, just a little bit down the screen a little bit, there's a place that talks about um, presentation materials. And then you'll click on that and you'll go to FADD tube is the next option you'll select. When you go to FADD tube, a window will open up where you can see a list of different videos that are posted. Um, one folder is an EMRS folder. You open that folder, then you see all the EMRS videos. If for some reason when you click on those folders, you do not see those videos, that means you have not been granted access to the full FADI site. And so all you need to do is shoot me an email and I can put you in as a member and then you can see them. Um, the reason I didn't provide all that in this presentation is because not everybody has access to Fat Eye, and, and so if you have questions about it, just shoot me an email directly. I'll look you up, see if you're in there or not, and then send you individual directions on how to get in. But those videos are, are in there, and they're pretty good. They walk you through everything step by step, um, and you know they don't take long to watch. And um, I think that after watching them a time or two, um, you'll be very, very comfortable with entering the data. So maybe an idea, Brian, is to also maybe send out uh, those directions when I send out the PowerPoint. Yeah, that'd, that'd be fine. I can I can get them to you, Liz. Yeah, if you can do that, then I'll go ahead and include that. So I think that's very important. Um, I'd yeah. also like to, you know, I'm trying to come up with a whole other things to also include in um, different trainings that are available online, um, so I can add that to that that uh, file. Sure, and there there are, I think I've got five or six, maybe seven training videos in there now. They cover everything from how to enter permits and, you know, how to change the target environment, how to do what we did today. I mean, there's, there's several different options there, and we're continually adding to that library. So it's a good idea to check it every once in a while and see if there's something new. That's great. That's great. So on behalf of the best. Uh, Veterinary Services National Training Exercise Program, I'd like to thank you, Brian, um, for presenting today. And as a reminder for everyone, if you have any ideas for webinars that um, the VSNTEP can explore for emergency preparedness, feel, please feel free to contact me. Um, you can find other va webinars on vaccine and many other topics on the PEP video gallery online, which is posted on APHIS USDA Animal Health Training and Development Video Gallery. And the link for the video gallery is also listed on the webinar announcement. So be sure to watch your emails for upcoming webinars that are in the process of being scheduled. And with that, I would like to bid you all a very nice afternoon. Thanks, everyone. That Thanks, concludes, Liz. That concludes Thank our you. conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.